Okay, guys. Well, um, thank you so much, Perez in the area, for joining us for Positive Behavior Supports. Um, I was laughing when we got to thinking about today because um, I was saying tomorrow, right? Tomorrow, February, which is the second month, and the second day um, on Tuesday at two. So <laughs> I guess two is the number of the day. Or if this was Sesame Street, it would be brought to you by the number two. <laughs> Um, so anyway, we're so excited to have you today. Tammy, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yep, I'm Tammy Cheatham. And as we remember last month, I had to go solo because Steph was, or two months ago, she yeah. was not around. So I'm glad she's back. <laughs> yes, I had quite the bout of um, COVID and I was still on oxygen at home and uh, worried about being out of breath and Tammy was awesome and covered for me and I appreciate her. That's what teamwork is all about. So, um, and yeah, I'm Steph Lundgren. I'm from the PD team here. And so we're so excited to see you guys. Um, you know, I think that Paris are, you know, the pioneers of Zoom connections at schools because we've been doing this for years, right? You guys have been having Zoom class all year long for several years now. So we're gonna do just a little mental health check-in. Um, these are really good to do with your students too, especially at, the, especially at these times when we're worried a little bit more about their mental health. And um, uh, you know, some of our kids have not reacted well to maybe some of the isolation that is involved when they um, have to quarantine. Um, so go ahead and read through these heart statements and see where you fall today. Anyone want to share out where they are? I'd say I'm at a yellow to red, honestly. Um, I'm feeling, I'm happy and feeling great for sure. Maybe fo uh, full of love and doing amazing. I'm, I'm not just saying this. I really am not just saying this, but I love working with you, Paris. Um, it's some of the best parts of my job. So it's always a great day when I know I'm going to see you on the other end of the camera. Anyone else want to share? Can you hear? Uh huh. Yep. Uh, this is Deb, and I would say mostly orange, maybe a little bit of green. Okay. So, you know, it's one of those gray, dreary winter days, right? We're a little cold. We maybe could be doing a little bit better, but you're okay today. That's good yeah. to know. Even if we were talking to students, it's good to know you're feeling okay. And this is Sherry from Stuart, and I would say I'm probably orange. Um, I'm feeling really good today. Just, I... I guess today was a good day with the kids. Good. All right. So everything's kind of smooth sailing there. Anybody else want to share? Well, again, there's there's a million and one check-ins um, like this right now on Google. You can just um, Google them and see. Um, it's nice to know about if, if you're working with adults, their, your audience and how they're feeling, but also your students, you can better understand them and really see, do they need some more support? Um, so, you know, definitely if you have kids that are feeling down the line there, um, down towards the bottom, um, they need you. They need to um, have somebody reach out to them and help them through a dark spot. So today we're gonna to talk um, about um, uh, those positive behavior supports. And in a lot of our schools, we have something called PBIS or positive behavior in schools. And um, so um, they have come up with some of these ideas. Now, some of your schools don't follow the PBIS framework and that's fine. It still has some great strategies for you to use as you work with kids in your school. And um, today we're gonna to talk about consistency. Um, so, as we move along, consistency in classroom and behavior management relates to a steady, unchanging follow through on routines, policies, and procedures, and the consequences you have established. 
All right, so for any school to be successful, you really need to have that consistency in the way that you work with kids. Um, from, you know, you being in a classroom with, um, you know, the rules and procedures that a teacher has laid out to um, maybe pulling a small group in another classroom or even in the hallway or when you work with your students in the lunchroom, you want consistency amongst staff members. Um, I remember a time I really needed consistency and it wasn't there was when I had playground duty just one day a week um, at recess and the paras were there every day but the teachers rotated through and it was inconsistent because every teacher had different expectations for the kids and it uh, it was too much for me. I'm a rules and procedures kind of person. And uh, I know that the kids didn't know what they could get away with and not. <laughs> so consistency is a good thing to have um, those steady, unchanging follow through. You think about that for your kids. And mostly I think about this for the kids who struggle with behaviors. How unpredictable is it to go from one teacher to the other and have, have the rules change on them at every turn? We need to think about our neediest kid. You know, our, our pretty well-behaved kids, kids who um, have good self-regulation, they're going to be pretty steady in any environment. Um, but our kids who struggle really need to have that defined clearly. So are you being consistent? Am I being consistent? Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and move these pictures a little bit. Consistency does not necessarily mean that every student has exactly the same consequence for a specific behavior. Um, have we heard that phrase, uh, fair is not always equal, right? Different kids need different supports. Most schools have an array of responses to behavior that can be applied depending on a variety of factors, right? For example, um, history with that student or specific circumstances or perceived function of the behavior and other considerations. So, um, you know, your school probably has something kind of laid out. If you do this, this is the consequence, right? Hey, Tammy, will it allow you to advance the slides? There we go. Okay, it worked then. Okay, so consistency starts with reinforcement. So we should, and by reinforcement, they mean a positive reinforcement that we, um, sometimes it's called praise or um, just um, acknowledging that we see kids doing the right thing. So we should attempt to provide four to five reinforcements for every one correction. So if we think about that, are we saying four to five positive things for every one kind of negative thing that we see? I didn't always do that in my classroom. And um, I can tell you what, we really noticed in my classroom when that ratio got off. We'd get in kind of that snarly, funky mood, right? And we'd have to just kind of shake it off. And sometimes I'd say, say to the kids, let's start again. How are we going to do this? We're in this growly mood. Um, so, um, you know, even just saying a student's name, if it's meant to redirect them, that's considered a negative. Okay. So we want to have four to five positive things we say to kids um, to one correction. We'll get into the details of that in a minute here. And this takes being mindful of our rate of enforce, reinforcement, right? We have to really be thinking about, am I doing this right? Many teachers and paras use like a clicker or a counter to help keep track of their ratio of reinforcement. Um, you know, I've known some teachers that have been working on it. They even put a sticky note or a piece of tape on their hand and they write down, they, they make tally marks every positive that they say. And then another on another part, they have the negatives to see, am I being positive enough? Research has demonstrated repeatedly over many years that we all respond to reinforcement, adults and children. We might say, oh, they're high school kids. They don't need to hear that they're doing a good job with something, right? That might embarrass them. But actually, um, the research shows that no matter the age, we all respond well to it. 
And there's the old adage that you get more um, of whatever you pay attention to is still true. So um, sometimes they say um, energy flows where attention goes, right? So that's, that's what I think of. If I'm paying attention to all those negative things in the room, that's where all of our energy gets put, right? Um, and it brings us down. If I'm paying attention to all the positive things that are going on and I start talking about all the positive things I'm seeing, then that's the mood and the energy level of our classroom. And we know that even high school students respond well to reinforcement. Um, this can come in the form of verbal recognition or even a, a pat on the back while you name the specific behavior you're reinforcing. Like, um, hey, um, you know, thanks for picking up that trash in the hallway. You know, something simple like that. Hey, thanks for being a good friend to the other kids around you. Um, or your teamwork is um, really apparent because I see you talking to every member of your group. Um, that kind of thing. Um, or it can just be, hey, you know, that pat on the back and that you're doing a great job when you, um, um, you know, shared your feelings with your group before you lost your cool. Good job. And then we have to have consistency too when we think about office referrals. And um, that's a kind of big part about PBIS and monitoring that kind of thing. But you think about when you're working with students, you know, and I think about pairs a lot on the playground or in the lunchroom, in the hallway, some of those times when um, supervision is really your responsibility. Um, so we wanna be super consistent about what we would refer on to the teachers or to the office. So most major behaviors are fairly easy to categorize. And for minors, you'll need to follow the lead of the teacher and be as consistent as you can be, right? So for minor things, do what the teachers do. If, if you're working with students out of a certain classroom, follow the procedures that this teacher would follow. Don't let them get away with something with you that they wouldn't get away with in their classroom. Um, and it's kind of hard, vice versa. You, you want to hold about the same standards as the teacher holds. So if the teacher's looser than you tend to be, you kind of have to um, adjust to, to that or talk it through with the teachers. I think good communication on those um, routines and procedures is, is a good thing. And I, heard, I was just going to interject here. I heard um, that there was a principal that when he caught, let's say the, the junior high kids and they were either running in the hall or poking at each other. And he goes, Oh, you know, he stopped him. I'm sorry. I must not have done a good job of teaching you to, to walk in the hall. And he goes that I am so sorry. I apologize. That is my fault. He goes, you know what, let's just start taking some time to practice. And he made it sound like a classroom bell. And then he made him walk in the hall and did that over and over and decided that um, he says, well, I guess next time, I, I think I'll bring my whistle, but I hope that you get the, the just, you know, I, I again, apologize because I didn't teach you that right way. So I thought that was putting a positive spin on redirecting them and having them do um, what he wanted them to do. So I, I love that idea. I do too. So much better than crabbing and hollering at kids in the hallway. Hey, stop, slow down, get back here. What are you doing? You know how to do that. And he puts it on himself and he almost makes a joke of it. Oh, I didn't teach you how to do that. Come on guys, let's, let's learn it. Let's practice. So good. So consistency means that you do your best to use positive language and make referrals in a consist consistent manner. This um, doesn't mean that students will get all the same consequence for their behavior, right? Um, referrals should be made while um, consistently following your definitions of major and minor behaviors. So if it's a major thing that happens, a fight, right? That's probably going to be an office referral right away. Um, or um, I'm trying to think about some um, destroying property, right? While that might be in some in some situations, that might be a major offense, right? If kids are out on the playground and they intentionally break a window on a storage shed, let's just say, right? Um, uh, and, and you see that happen, that might be an office referral where 
um, some other kids might uh, have kicked a ball <laughs> and it hit that window and the window broke. So it's situational in that way. It's also situation based on that kid's history and stuff like that. But we wanna be pretty consistent with what we refer on. Not just because it's this kid and we're getting tired of it from this kid and this kid's wearing down our patients. Um, that doesn't constitute always an office referral. Okay, so strategies to increase consistency and compliance and decrease those unwanted behaviors, right? So we can take, we can take some um, initiative to, you know, decrease the un unwanted behaviors based on how we react. So by going over the expectations frequently and reinforcing desired behaviors, students will start to know the expectations and know that they will get more staff attention for displaying appropriate behaviors. Um, we were talking earlier about um, playground duty, right? Um, so I had a way that I wanted the kids to walk out from the lunchroom um, to the playground with me. And in that, um, my last school, um, they had to walk through a hallway um, that would have some noise level to other classrooms for high school kids. Um, they also had to walk across a, play, uh, a parking lot and I didn't want anybody to get hit by a car, right? So I had some um, behaviors I wanted to see out of the kids. And before I'd have them line up at the door and it might've been 50 kids or more <laughs> at the time. And um, we'd go over those procedures before we went out, okay? So um, another thing um, one of my schools did is we went over expectations in our classrooms a lot in the, uh, the beginning of the year, especially because we wanted to make kids um, really accountable for those and make sure that they knew them. And so um, maybe we would go over the, the procedures for walking to the playground before they went to lunch in the classroom. And maybe then I would ask them before we left the lunchroom. And um, we can't even think that those older kids, those high school kids, junior high kids, that they know all the procedures, they need to be taught them too. So we go over them a lot. Um, and if you do need to remind a student to follow those classroom expectations, be sure to be consistent, right? Um, praise others for following the expectations and then quietly redirect the student who's off task. And by quietly asking them instead of hollering out their name or whatever, or doing it in front of their friends, you're um, saving their dignity, right? And they're more likely to come on board with you if you're not embarrassing them. So again, in this time, again, four to one or five to one positives to negatives. Hey, I see you walking quietly. Oh, I saw you look both ways before you crossed the parking lot. Oh my gosh, you were so quiet in the building. I know that the high school kids could still learn um, with your quiet voice. So reinforce that stuff and give them the positives. We're gonna help create that school culture that encourages trust. Okay, so promises to follow up are kept. So, hey, I'm gonna come back to you. I'm gonna follow up with you later. Um, and, and they have to know that when you say that, that you're really gonna do it, okay? Um, students are listened to. When they're listened to, they feel valued. I think we do as adults too, when we're, we're listened to, we're valued. So um, we feel valued, we wanna do better. We want, it just builds um, relationships. And students are supported and protected. So even in that time of having some behavioral needs, we're there to support them, right? We're there to say, hey, I'm gonna help you through this. I'm gonna help you learn this better, not just crab at you, but I'm going to um, help you learn this skill so it doesn't happen again. But then just greater that no matter what, they know that they can turn to the adults in the building for that support and protection. And we need to understand our school's expectations, policies, and procedures, right? I think it's really important that Paris, that you all learn these. Um, if you're asked to look over a new area or supervise a new area, or maybe you're going into a new classroom that you haven't been a part of in the past, you need to learn these expectations, policies, and procedures. So um, you should be able to explain those things um, to students, coworkers, and parents. Also follow your school's prescribed pro process, right? We want that process to stay the same in all settings. 
and then commit um, to follow positive policies and procedures as a means of causing positive change for students. That you're not just there to enforce the rules, but help students learn them better and help students perform better. And we consistently strive to build relationships with students. So these are just some ideas here. One thing is to just greet students enthusiastically each day and even learning their names and knowing all the kids' names to be able to call them by name, it, even if that's just one classroom at a time. Um, Stuart and Boyd County, you're with us right now and you're in smaller settings where you probably know every kid's name. Um, just when kids come to school and they hear that and they see their name around on the walls, that's part of building relationships. Also let students know that you care and ask them what they're doing outside of school hours, right? This is, we've talked a lot about building relationships with our students, right, over the years together. And one of them is just to ask them, hey, how'd your basketball go, game go this weekend? Or, oh my gosh, I know that you love dinosaurs and did you see this special on TV last night? Or, you know, just ask them what's going on, how they're doing. Maybe you know something about their family. Oh my gosh, I heard that you had a new baby in your family. How's that going? Um, what's, you know, what's, what's your relationship like with that baby? Um, and talk to them about what they're interested in outside of school, um, especially when you notice a student seems distracted or upset make that extra effort to reach out to them and to check in and to see how they're doing. Oh my gosh, maybe you're gonna show them that check-in that we um, had on the first slide there and say, hey, tell me how you'd be feeling today. Or I noticed that you're a little down to date. What's going on? Could I help you with anything? Do you need someone to talk to? Okay, so we're going to do a little activity in your um, groups here that you're sitting with. And I want you to think of a student that you have helped in the past to get through a rough time. What did you do that made a difference for the student? And do you think having a good relationship with a student made a difference in your ability to help? So go ahead and talk in your settings about that and then I might have you unmute to share out a little bit. Okay, does anybody want to volunteer to share out? Hey, Michelle's group, what town are you guys in? Oh, you guys are muted. Okay. We're in Madison. I thought that was my Madison peeps there. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. I just got a couple dates to come out and see you again too. Okay, did you guys have any conversation about a student that you've helped okay. in the past? Okay. Well, there was a student who was a little bit, um, there was a student that was a little bit upset um, in regards to her dad, but then we talked about it and she was excited because she got to spend time with him during Christmas and then again on her on, on her birthday. So, I mean, I do, um, in the morning, I do greet her, see how she's doing, how her weekend is, and she's always talking to me, you know, letting me know, and then she gets excited because, you know, 
she just told me told me today that she was going to see her dad on the fifth, so she keeps on getting, you know. Yeah. It's a good thing that. We kind of help the kids turn their thoughts around, right, to positives, and even just be yeah. a sounding board for them. Do you think that that relationship mm -hmm. you're building with that student is helping deal with that? Yeah, I mean, she gets when she's down or when she comes in or she just looks a little bit upset or something. I'll just you know talk to her and and you know tell her that everything will get you know. Um, just for her to just trying to do something to cheer her up. Sure. I mean. Yep. And she knows she can count on you. That's the important part. I think to have one person to count on is huge. Anyone else in Boyd County yeah. or Stewart? Do you guys have an example? Um, a student maybe building a relationship with a student, but maybe uh, somebody tries to remember to a student. Okay, we're gonna keep rolling here. So I'm sure that we get through this, but I'm sure that you guys have examples all the time. Cause that's one thing about pairs. You're so good at um, having those moments being side by side with a student. And sometimes you get that quiet conversation with them that teachers miss when they're dealing with the whole classroom. Okay, um, so research tells us that um, many students report not having a positive relationship with anyone at school. Um, even when this is something that students cause by their own withdrawal, it is real to them and it's not good. I mean, even if it's their nature to withdraw, it doesn't mean it's a healthy thing, right? So we need to have um, at least a positive relationship for every kid at school. They need to have at least one friend, at least one adult that they think that they can turn to when they really need to. So just kind of think through to yourself, do you think your own repeated attempts to establish a relationship can eventually pay off for the student and for you? A few years ago, we talked about the um, two by 10, um, where you find two minutes 10 days in a row to talk to a kid who seems withdrawn and really make a connection with that kid. Um, and I think that that's where we do see the payoff. We do see that kids gain those relationships. When they think you're a friend, um, they're not gonna misbehave as much for you, right? You win them over, you get them on your side. So we need that consistency in managing challenging behaviors. So, uh, we need to involve peers, teachers, paraprofessionals, and parents. PBIS, and most of your schools are PBIS. If it's not, it is a school-wide thing. That's what we want to promote this school-wide. But whether you're PBIS or not, we know that when we involve peers, teachers, paraprofessionals, and parents all working together, we get better results. It's a community effect. And paraprofessionals often have a great vantage point to direct peer conflicts, head them off, and to intervene with students. You might see those quiet little conversations that might lead to a blow up, but you're going to be so proactive that you get to it before it's even a problem and say, hey, guys, could we talk this through um, before you start arguing with each other? And consistency promotes prevention. Okay, so we want to prevent the problems, right? Not just react to problems that happen. If we can prevent them and not even have a problem, all the better. So when you consistently remind students of school-wide expectations and procedures, problems are prevented. Okay, so we're gonna remind them even if it hasn't happened yet, right? And remember to use some standard strategies and we're gonna talk through these strategies like teleheads or pre-corrections, um, also specific praise or positive specific feedback and providing choices when possible. I think we like all of those things as adults too. So some of these strategies are teleheads or pre-corrections um, are proactive reminders that help students to remember and follow school-wide classroom expectations. Now I, I gave you an example of that when I talked about um, taking the kids out to the playground, right? I also had a student um, 
uh, with autism that had a real uh, hard time at art class. It, art requires a lot of fine motor skills and he did not um, uh, have the best fine motor skills that we've ever seen. And so before he went into art class every week, I would stop him and I'd say, hey buddy, um, we're going to art class. What happens if you start to feel frustrated? And he'd talk through a couple of his strategies. He'd say, well, I can either count to 10 or um, I can tell the art teacher that I need a quick break and I can walk out to the water fountain and count up as I go to the water fountain and count down as I come back to um, class and I can cool off while I'm at that water fountain. And I'd say, okay. And what happens, you know, I, I give him some different scenarios and talk through those expectations and it really helped him because it brought those expectations to the forefront. Even though he was nine years old, he probably, you know, some people would have said, gosh, they should know the rules for art class by now. Um, this really helped him be more successful. Um, so another example is, uh, remember, we're coming um, back into school now, recall hallway expectations, stay to the right with quiet voices. And then I might ask the kids to say them back in a choral response. What are we going to do? Say them back with, or um, uh, stay to the right with quiet voices and make sure that all kids could verbalize that. Um, so um, teleheads are especially helpful during transitions, um, going from recess back into a building, coming into the classroom after lunch, coming in from gym or PE, or like I said, going to a specials class, something really routine like that. And also um, remember when you're using a telehead or pre-correction technique, uh, you make sure you have their students' attention before you make the statement. If the kids are still talking and they're talking right through it, it's not going to do any good. So sometimes um, when I was leading kids in from um, recess, um, I would put my hand up and I would wait until every kid had their hand up like a stop sign with me um, like this. Okay, I'd stand with my hand up and I'd just be silent until everybody caught on. And I'd say, okay, guys, we're going to move in the hallway. How do we move in the hallway? We move silent straight and our hands at our sides and then they do this with me silent straight hands at our sides and we'd walk through the class through the hallway um but if unless you have their their attention it's going to do no good to repeat those procedures right all right and it says to keep it simple and that's that was my silent straight hands at your side because we got to the point where we didn't even say the words with it anymore I'd say, we're going in the hallway, and they would go. Right, so silent, straight hands at your sides. We had hand motions, but we didn't need to say it all the time. We knew what those procedures were, but we probably said the words for at least a month of school. We knew what that meant. All right, now we also want to have very specific praise or positive specific feedback. It has to be specific or it loses its effect, right? Um, so if we just say, um, we, we could have the example of something very specific. Thank you, Janet, for raising your hand and waiting to speak. Way to show respect. But a non-example, something that isn't so good is just good job, Janet, right? Does Janet know exactly what I'm praising if I just say good job? No. Okay. So we want to always name the behavior that we're seeing in the kids and tell them that that's good. Okay. Oh my gosh. Everyone, you were so quiet in the hallway. Um, I couldn't hear a thing. Thank you for doing that for me. Good job. And as much as possible, positive praise or feedback is used to increase behaviors that, that the school is working on, right? If this is something that's been hard for them, really notice when they're doing a good job. Okay, if the boys' bathroom has been very loud in the past, you praise the kids as they come out. My gosh, I wouldn't have even known you were in there because you were so quiet. Thank you so much. Or um, we can think of lots of different things, but the, the whole nice job, good job isn't enough. We need to name that behavior. Uh, teachers may notice that specific unwanted behavior has increased um, and um, that's when we really 
um, target this behavior. I think we talked about that already here. Um, Remember, your involvement is vitally important to molding and shaping behavior. Positive specific feedback is a powerful tool that can greatly encourage and increase appropriate behaviors. And I think that's a special tool of Paris too. You know a teacher's working on something in their classroom with their um, class, um, and you can go around and give praise while the teacher's still teaching and give that reinforcement of my gosh, uh, you're sitting up straight at your desk and you are looking at the teacher while she talks. That's really good. You know, so those little things that are going on while you're in a classroom too are excellent. So we also want to offer choices. I think we all operate better when we have choices rather than things that are all dictated for us. Uh, so whenever possible, we give kids a choice, okay? And this can be really simple, right? So the second bullet there says, if the example is if they have a couple things to finish, a few assignments to finish, you just let them pick which one first. Which one, which one of these things do you think you wanna work on first? And they say, oh, I wanna do my math first because I might have some questions on that and um, I can ask them to you here instead of when I'm home doing homework, right? Um, it just makes kids feel like they have more agency, right? Have more control of the situation. And um, make sure the choices that you offer are realistic. So if it's not realistic to offer one of the things, don't, don't even mention it, right? If you can't carry through. And don't offer a take it or leave it. Um, so either you can start this right now or you're going to go to the office, <laughs> right? That's not really a choice, is it? Um, and you could say, you know, um, would you like to start this right now? Or would you like to start this in two minutes? Do you need a little time to, to just transition into that? Even just two minutes or, you know, the power of walking to the drinking fountain and walking back, I think for my class was always a good one. Just, if you need to just quick, get your mind like worked up to, we're going to do this task and then on their walk back, they're thinking about it. And usually kids are pretty good about that. Okay, so um, we are, um, we're gonna take a quick time. I want you to just quick talk in your groups about, uh, can you think of a time that you used a telehead or one of those pre-corrections with students? Um, or you could think of a time that you had some positive specific feedback for the kids um, and or a choice that you've given kids, right? Go ahead and talk. Maybe if we can share out in just a couple minutes as we go around the group, one of those scenarios um, for each of you.
Okay. I know that probably wasn't enough time for everybody to share out all the things that they do because I, I know t uh, Paris are pretty good at these skills. Um, Lynch, do you guys have anything to tell us about? I can unmute. Well, I don't think I can unmute you, but you could unmute you. Could you share something you talked about? Anybody in Lynch? I think it might be hard to unmute there. How about in Brittany, where are you? Are you in Spencer or in Butte? Maybe you guys could share. We're in Butte. Okay. Um, I guess an example for me is I have a child in preschool that has a hard time with schedule and routine, and I give him choices throughout the day, either do what you're supposed to be doing, or you can go sit in the calm down, or when it was nice out, or we can go for a walk and come back. Mm -hmm. So either way, he wasn't, he wanted to go play, and that would have been a distraction to everybody else, but this way he was either doing what he was supposed to be doing or doing something that wasn't distracting to the others. Sure. And maybe that calm down thing that maybe we can on our little walk, we can work our way back into the group as we come back. If we just needed to move for a bit. Yeah. Okay. Now, most of the time he picks what he's supposed to be doing. So it's worked. Good. Good. He's gotten better. Okay. Now I think I have Lynch with me. Did you guys have anything, any discussions? Okay. Well, it hasn't helped much yet, but we're still working on it. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Which which one of them in particular? Uh, before they leave the room to walk up a ramp to leave for the, the night, we have a student that will just, there's some slower ones that we got to make sure get brought up and get on the bus. And this one will just take off no matter what we say. You're going to have to walk back to the bottom and walk it again and it just doesn't seem to change him mm -hmm. he still holds out the door and races to the top even though we make him walk back down and go again sure so maybe that catching him before he goes and say now what are you going to do to do for me right now and if he verbalizes it that might help out just having him um say that and also sometimes that practice of that skill when it's not the excitement of the end of the day might help too so if you have just a little time you can pull them even for just two minutes and say hey come on come practice show me what it's going to be like at the end of the day how are you going to walk out and then that praise is huge right tons of praise about how that one does it and how others do it might help all right Okay, good job, guys. Uh, we want to have consistent interactions with students, right? So um, to the greatest extent possible, um, we attempt to make your interactions with students positive, encouraging, and kind. There are going to be some things that happen that might come out negative at first, like stop. It's when it's a safety issue, right? Stop. We need to think about how this is happening. And now we want them to verbalize it in a positive way. What do I expect in this situation, everyone? And have them tell you. Um, and know that you're encouraging and kind and not that person who's a crab at them, right? Um, research has shown that cheerfully greeting students daily provides them with a positive role model and encourages them to do the same. Okay, they might not have had a cheerful greeting when they were at home right, for the day. Maybe they got themselves ready and they haven't seen anyone and or maybe the family was in a rush and was growly at each other. We want to give them that cheerful interaction. So act like you're happy to see each and every one of them walk through the doors that day. And being enthusiastic, positive, and encouraging lets students know that you care, right, and you're supportive, that they, it makes it feel like a place they want to come. If people were growly to them first thing, 
they might not be very excited to come. I know I wouldn't be. <laughs> All right, so we have um, some just review of some of the key points today. So we need to, uh, you know, do you recall a definition of consistency? It's that follow through and steadiness for kids, right? And um, we can think about the answers to these questions as I ask, what does consistent reinforcement mean? What does the research on reinforcement tell us, right? It has to be positive, right? Positives to negatives and that it works for all ages. How can you make referrals more consistent hmm, in your school? Is it consistent or is it inconsistent? Do certain kids always get sent and other kids never get sent? How can reviewing expectations help your students? We talked about pre-correcting things, catching them before it happens. And what does it mean to have consistent communication in a common language. How do your actions encourage a culture of trust in you in your school? Okay, can kids count on you to be steady and even and positive? And have you built those relationships with your students? Now I'll have you discuss some of these in your groups. Uh, time is short, but that's we'll we'll get this done. Do you have ideas on how to manage challenging behaviors more consistently? Can you think of some strategies to help manage those behaviors? Can you think of some ways to make your interactions with students more consistent? Can you think of some of the times when you could increase your use of active supervision, moving, scanning, and interacting with students? And as you look through this, um, review or record anything, but I just want you to make a note to yourself of a goal of something you're gonna try as, um, you know, when you leave here today, what's something that you're gonna try to um, do to increase your consistency for students? Just quickly tell your colleagues. It's amazing. I can to totally tell that you're having conversations even though you're masked. <laughs> I can still see. Okay, so hopefully um, you mentioned some things. I can see Telehead's choices and some specific positive feedback really uh, being big impacts you can have on your schools and just making sure you maintain that four to one or five to one positive to negative. And something that we're hitting um, every um, training this month or this year is to fill our cups. And so with February being all about love, right? We want you to take some time to love yourself and talk nicely to yourself, right? Um, sometimes I think we're very hard on ourselves. Uh, so positive self-talk is a great um, action. Um, we talk about the positives and the negatives. Are we like that with ourselves, right? Do we say four or five to one positives to negatives when we're thinking about ourselves? Um, here are some little um, cards that help remind us to stay positive. Like, I am ready to love myself fully, or it's okay to do what's best for me. Oh my gosh, Paris. I think you need that message, right? It's okay to do what's best for yourself sometimes. Sometimes you need to protect yourself. I have to say, I had to practice that a little bit. I mentioned I was sick over the holidays and I am a baker. And I had to 
um, just decide that my traditional Christmas cookie trays that I delivered to my friends with 14 kinds of cookies were not going to happen this year. It just wasn't going to happen and self care was going to happen. So um, I had to change some things. Um, and uh, so if you think about one thing that you're down on yourself about, flip that statement, right? Stop it in its track in your head and uh, flip the statement around like, um, I'm always late for work. <laughs> you can say something like, um, I use my time efficiently. Right. And kind of think that through that mantra and it will help you become better with that. And Tammy and I found some little cards like this and they're going to be delivered out to you at your school. So those of you who have watched this and heard this already, um, you know that you have a little Valentine treat coming from us. And we want to remind you um, as you spread a whole bunch of love to your buildings every day, also take that time to love yourselves and take care of yourselves. And that starts first in our own minds, right? We believe what we tell ourselves. So you're going to have a special delivery for us in the next week or two. And we also want to remind you that um, we have one more pair of training this year on April 6th. Remember, it's always the first Tuesday at 2. Um, it'll be here on Zoom and you get to that link at bit.ly slash pairs of ESU8. And we're gonna talk about transitions. Um, um, we're, we'll talk about some transitions from like class to class or classroom to classroom, that kind of thing. But also um, in the springtime, we have a lot of students that are gonna be transitioning to uh, maybe a new grade level and a new building or a new setting for the next year. And so we'll talk about some great supports that you can give to students um, during those times. Any other thoughts to share for the group, everyone? Got nothing else. Everybody's masked and quiet. <laughs> Well, we just want to say thank you, um, Nebraska uh, PBIS, for helping us with some of this wonderful content. And also, Tammy and I are here for you. So please reach out if you need anything. Our emails were above, or you can find our phone numbers on the ESU8 uh, website. So thank you for joining us today. Go out. Thank you. Good job. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. But anyway, yeah, as far as handing out, it's, it's hard, you know.